Hi, everybody. Welcome to my second lecture for my class, Sustainability Issues in Energy. In this lecture, we're going to talk about some of the problems that are associated with our use of fossil and renewable energy. Unfortunately, what I'm going to show you today is there's really no such thing as a free lunch, and there's a lot of challenges that we need to overcome if we really want to achieve sustainable energy. So the key point of this lecture is that the way in which we produce and consume energy needs improving. I showed you in the first lecture how energy is good and it leads to improvements in quality of life. But in this lecture, we'll talk about some of the issues associated with it. So I wanna start out by talking a little bit about ice coring and how we understand what the composition of the atmosphere has been in the uh, geologic past. So when you look at places like Greenland or Antarctica, which are covered all the time with ice, what happens is that snow is deposited at the, uh, at the surface. And then over time, as it gets buried by more and more snow, um, those snow crystals anneal and they turn into blockier ice crystals. And eventually they fuse together. And the air that is present in the interstitial space between those crystals gets trapped. And so down at a depth of somewhere between 60 and 100 meters below the surface, that air will be trapped and it's no longer able to get out. So what we can do is we can go to places like Greenland or Antarctica and actually drill down and collect core samples of that ice. Here are some images from a coring expedition in Greenland. So there's the final ice core after it's been taken out of the coring barrel here. And by doing this, we've been able to reconstruct the atmospheric composition um, over the last 110,000 years from Greenland and in Antarctica back to at least 750,000 years before present. So the way we analyze these is the cores are then taken to a lab where they're cut into shorter pieces. And then the ice is melted very slowly. And as it melts, it releases the trapped gases that are in there. And then you can analyze the composition of those gases with gas chromatography and other types of, of methods like that. What we found is that the composition of the atmosphere, and I'm specifically going to talk about carbon dioxide concentration, um, measured from those ice cores agrees really, really well with our measurements of the actual atmosphere itself. So here's a comparison of atmospheric CO2 measured at the South Pole in the air. So that's what this line is here. And the record goes back to about 1959. And then that's compared with these dots, which are ice core data taken from Law Dome, which is an area of Antarctica. And you can see that for the period of time where the data sets overlap, there's very, very good agreement. And so it's generally accepted within the scientific community that these ice core observations are good you know, representations of the composition of the atmosphere. Now, what have we learned from these ice cores? Well, this is a plot of carbon dioxide concentrations over the last 800,000 years um, determined from ice core records. And you can see that there's somewhat of a you know, periodicity in here where we've got higher CO2 concentrations during warmer periods. So these are periods between ice ages. And then during the ice ages, the glacial episodes, we have lower CO2 concentration. And this pattern has been repeating itself over and over again throughout the Pleistocene and, uh, and even earlier. So um, on this particular plot, the um, highest measured CO2 concentration was 300 parts per million. Now, if I add on there what's happened in the last couple of hundred years, you can see here's the plot for the average atmospheric concentration in 2020. And the CO2 concentration was 412.5 parts per million. Now in 2022, we're even higher than that. And so what we're learning is that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere right now is considerably higher than it's been for at least the past 800,000 years. Now, one interesting thing we can do, I found this plot online in a, in a, 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 a subreddit here, um, 
is that we can actually, you can expand the, uh, the X axis starting um, at the end of the last ice age, which was roughly about 18,000 years ago. Um, and so here we are, yeah, they've got it marked a little bit later, but some, somewhere in there. So this is those periodic ups and downs that I talked about in the previous graph. So there's a couple of things noted on here, you know, first evidence of Neanderthals in modern humans, there's the start of the last ice age. Um, here's the last glacial maximum. And then the CO2 level is going up again since then. And you can see that um, we've got, you know, ancient Egypt, the Roman Empire, um, first use of gunpowder. Really what happens is at the start of the Industrial Revolution, all of a sudden that CO2 concentration goes really, really high. There's Bitcoin there at the end. So the question I have here is there's something special about the Industrial Revolution. Well, from my previous lecture, you know that that is when, at least in the United Kingdom, we started seeing the really widespread use of coal as a fuel source. And certainly since then, we know that the fraction of energy that comes from fossil sources has considerably increased. And this has been correlated with a large increase in atmospheric CO2. In fact, if you plot both um, atmospheric CO2 in parts per million and CO2 emissions from fossil fuels, it's in gigatons here on the other y-axis, over time, you can see that they both go up. They both go up at the same time. So there's definitely a correlation there. Now, let's all remember correlation does not equal causation. However, we have a little bit of scientific understanding here to inform our analysis. So how do we know that this CO2 does come from fossil fuels? Let's start out there. So obviously what I just showed you is that the increase in atmospheric CO2 tracks with the increase in CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion. So there's a correlation for you. Um, here's another correlation, or this is really just an observation, but atmospheric, atmospheric CO2 was never this high before the Industrial Revolution going back 800,000 years. So this is also an observation and a correlation. Now, here's where we get a little bit into the causative nature of this. If we consider natural sources and sinks of carbon dioxide, uh, which include the ocean and uh, weathering of silicate rocks, and that sort of thing. Volcanoes are a good natural source that we can look at. And I'll talk about this later on in my lectures on uh, carbon sequestration. What we can see is that despite considerably uncertainty in our understanding of natural sources and sinks, um, the difference that these sources and sinks would make is very, very small compared to the observed increase in CO2 over the past 250 years. It just can't be explained by natural source and sink balance, okay? Um, and then most importantly, the isotopic composition of the atmospheric CO2 is consistent with it having come from a combusted fossil source rather than some natural process like volcanic activity or um, decaying organic matter. So isotopic composition, well, what is that? Okay, so carbon, which uh, we've learned in chemistry class, has many different isotopes, and this has to do with the number of, uh, number of neutrons it has in its nucleus. There's actually 15 of them. Um, many of them are radioactive and have extremely short uh, half-lives. Um, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are the only ones that are stable. They don't decay radioactively. And uh, carbon-14 is the only radioisotope uh, with a half-life longer than about 20 minutes. So carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,700 years, and that's why it's good for dating of archaeological records and that sort of thing. Okay, so these isotopes all occur, these three isotopes uh, can be found naturally. They, they just you know, naturally occur. Um, carbon-12 makes up about 99%. And um, carbon-13 makes up about 1%, and then carbon-14 is about 0.1%. So that's kind of a rounding error there. Um, these figures come from the uh, IUPAC. Um, but it's not totally just random which isotopes you're going to find. There are natural processes that favor certain isotopes over others, and they can cause the relative abundance of the isotopes to vary slightly, but in ways that we can measure. So let's look at an example of a natural process that tends to favor one particular isotope over another. So this is photosynthesis. 
So photosynthesis in its most general form can be written by this equation where you take uh, six molecules of carbon dioxide, combine it with six molecules of water, and it produces glucose plus um, six O2. All right. Now, yes, I know for those um, you know biochemists out there, I know this is greatly simplified. Uh, please don't at me. I'm just a lowly geologist. Okay. Now, one thing that um, I like to harp on is the fact that nature is lazy. Nature is very lazy. And because carbon-12 weighs less than carbon-13, it takes less energy to, uh, for it to participate in this photosynthetic reaction. And so the uh, glucose that's produced in this reaction will preferentially include more carbon-12 than carbon-13 relative to the source of carbon. Okay, and this process is called fractionation. So when you're preferentially including a certain isotope over another, you're, you're fractionating that, um, that, that isotope. Now we can quantify the amount of fractionation by measuring something which is called a delta value. So we can measure this for any isotope we want, but the one that we often pay attention to here is delta, delta carbon 13, which is written as delta 13C. And the way that we do this is we measure the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 in a sample. So you do this by taking, for instance, um, you know, you can take your atmospheric gas and purify it. So you're just looking at the carbon dioxide and then run it through a mass spectrometer and see how much of it, each isotope you have. So you measure that ratio, then you compare it to some standard. Um, and then that'll give you a ratio, you subtract one, and then you multiply it by a thousand. And so um, it's going to give you a value in per mil because we multiply it by a thousand. That's what this symbol is here. Um, the standard for delta carbon 13 is um, what we call the Vienna PD belemnite. It's a, uh, it's a rock um, from uh, PD, I believe is uh, South Carolina. And um, you'll sometimes actually see the delta 13C values reported as a number per mil VPDB, and that's what the VPDB stands for. So that's the internationally accepted standard uh, for uh, carbon 13 fractionation. Okay, so what do we get out of this information? Well, plants, in addition to producing glucose, they're also producing carbohydrates and other things that are used for fuel and to build the structure of the plant. And any of those materials that are present in plants are going to have less carbon-13 relative to carbon-12. And so what this means is that if we um, measure the C13 to C12 ratio in our sample, it's going to be smaller than that in our standard. And so this ratio here will be less than one. And you subtract one from that, you'll get a negative number. And so um, typically for plants, and other biological materials, delta carbon-13 is, is a negative number. Um, for molecules that are produced by photosynthetic pathways, typically we're looking at values of minus 10 to minus 30 per mil. And so we call these depleted in carbon-13 as opposed to enriched, okay? Now, what does this have to do with modern atmospheric CO2 increases? How do we know they come from burning the fossil fuels? Well, think about where fossil fuels come from. They don't come from dinosaurs, okay? Don't get excited. They come from really boring stuff like algae and plant material and that sort of thing, which gets buried. So you start out here with your feedstock, you know, lignin, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and that gets buried and heated up and converted into various chemicals, including kerogen, uh, which then matures and can produce crude oil, natural gas, coal, that sort of thing, okay? And so the key here is that since we're starting mostly with photosynthetic products, then the carbon that's in our crude oil and our natural gas and our coal is going to be depleted in carbon-13. And so when we measure the atmospheric carbon concentration, if the CO2 comes from fossil fuel combustion, we expect it to be depleted in carbon-13. The other thing that happens is because oil and gas are old, typically many millions of years old, the carbon-14 has all decayed away. There's none left. So they're highly depleted in carbon-14. And so when we look at the isotopic signature of atmospheric CO2, this is exactly what we see. It's depleted in carbon-13. It's consistent with having come from a photosynthetic source of carbon, and they're highly depleted in carbon-14. 
Now, here's some more causative, uh, some interesting causative evidence. So going back to the early 1970s, people have been publishing these models where they predict what the global change in average temperature would be just from increases in carbon dioxide concentration based on what we know about what we call radiative forcing of CO2. So how much heat does it trap from the sun? And what I find particularly striking, this is um, from the uh, IPCC uh, 2021 um, report, they compare a bunch of these models to observed global average surface temperatures. That's what this dark line is here. And you can see that most of these models, with the exception of Rasul and Schneider, track really well over time. And what I find most striking is that if you look at these really early ones, they do a tremendously good job. So, you know, I'm going to pick on this Nordhaus, Nordhaus 1977. That's the stark blue line. I mean, look how well it's, you know, up to 2020, it's overestimating a little bit, but, you know, that's a surprising level of accuracy. And this just comes from modeling temperature change due to what we understand about how CO2 traps heat. So we know that the most of the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere uh, have been going up. And we know that that's due to combustion of fossil fuels. And we know that that's having an effect on global surface temperature. OK, so we can measure the carbon isotope concentrations and we can model this. And what we observe is completely consistent with uh, with the models. Now, it's not just CO2 emissions and temperature that we have to worry about from burning fossil fuels. There's also the uh, particulate matter um, and other chemicals that are produced as a result. So here's a, an interesting study by Annenberg et al, where they looked at um, uh, what they're calling transportation attributable uh, PM 2.5 and ozone deaths. Okay, so PM 2.5, this is particulate matter that's smaller than two microns. So, you know, soot, ash, that sort of thing that comes from, from combustion. Um, and you can see that, especially in East Asia and South Asia, there's a tremendous amount of deaths that they can attribute to uh, these chemicals, particularly uh, the particulate matter um, that is you know, caused by burning things, either fossil fuels or biomass um, or that sort of thing. So you know, th this is a big problem. Uh, this is another similar plot. This is just looking at India, and these are uh, it's a similar data set. This is um, from Miller et al. And again, they're looking at um, different um, cities in India and the number of uh, the deaths attributable to particulate matter and ozone as a function of population. You can see that you know, some of the larger cities in India have a very bad, bad problem with this. So the uh, pollution itself is also a concern to health and quality of life. This is also true in Texas. This is an interesting study looking at incidents of various types of cancer uh, with respect to proximity to an oil refinery. So oil refineries emit you know, a lot of different chemicals. And what we see from this is that there's a pretty strong correlation of cancer incidents uh, relative to the location of these refineries. So you know, look in the areas southeast of San Antonio, around Tyler, even up in the Panhandle, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's definitely a correlation. Now remember, correlation does not equal causation, but there's something going on here. Now here's another aspect to it. Um, oil and gas wells and refineries tend to be located in areas um, where the population is living in a greater, uh, a greater degree of poverty. Um, also, um, a lot is, this is a plot for California, you can see that many of the oil and gas wells, 67% of them are located in communities of color. So there's also some um, kind of socioeconomic uh, issues associated with this. Here's some interesting plots looking at oil refineries in the Philadelphia area and the Twin Cities area in Minnesota with respect to income uh, in different census tracts. You can see that the, you know, so the lighter colors here are going to be your uh, census tracts with lower income that these refineries, uh, they're the red dots, are preferentially located in census tracts with low income. So there's all kinds of aspects to our use of fossil fuels, despite how important they are as an energy resource. So obviously, 
if we continue to use fossil fuels, there's going to be environmental and social consequences that we're going to have to deal with. Now, one way of dealing with this is just to say, well, forget fossil fuels, let's just move completely to renewable energy. Okay, now this might sound like an easy solution, but let's look into it a little more. So there's um, you know, a whole kind of subculture on social media about people who like to dunk on Tesla owners and their um, somewhat um, snarky license plates. Um, but you know, the, the truth is, you really can't make uh, an electric vehicle right now without using any fossil fuels at all, okay? So I'm sure that this driver would love to forget oil, but this person's Tesla does include some fossil fuel products. So here's a breakdown of what goes into uh, Tesla Model S, which is actually what we're looking at here. Um, there's a lot of different things, but I want to call your attention to are plastic, okay? There are bioplastics that can come from biological materials, but uh, most of the plastic we have right now comes from, from oil, okay? Um, the steel that's used in some of the components of the car does include you know, coal, which is used in the coking process. Um, here's some more steel in the motor. And then the tires have rubber. Synthetic rubber comes from oil. So right there, you can't have your Tesla completely without having some fossil fuels in it. And in fact, when you look at um, carbon emissions associated with vehicle ownership over time, it's actually more carbon intensive to manufacture a Tesla than it is to manufacture a typical internal combustion vehicle, like a Toyota Camry, for instance, which is what this plot is showing. And a lot of that has to do with the, uh, the battery in the Tesla. It uses a lot of rare earth um, elements, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, and in addition to some of the components we just talked about. But then over time, after about a year, you can see that there's a crossover. And um, you know, depending on where you're getting your electricity from for your Tesla, you can really level out and you see a big difference in total CO2 emissions after a few years with respect to the Camry. Okay, now I mentioned the battery. So there is a carbon footprint associated with the battery, but let's look at what's typically in the battery. Okay, so this is the typical Tesla battery. It's big, weighs 1200 pounds, and it contains among other things, cobalt, lithium, uh, lithium salt as the electrolyte. And uh, you also notice nickel here, which um, I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, it's, it's a good battery. It gives you good range. It's, it's easy to charge, but it contains some kind of, funky, uh, kind of funky components. Now, what we're gonna see is that low carbon energy relies heavily on what we call critical minerals. So these are things like, you know, copper, lithium, nickel, et cetera. You can see the list over here. Um, so you can see that an electric car compared to a conventional car has many, many more of these um, um, critical minerals. Um, the same is true for uh, renewable energy compared to fossil energy. Uh, the equipment that's used to generate that energy uh, uses a lot more of these critical minerals. And it's interesting to look at where these critical minerals come from. So this is a plot looking at a comparison of fossil fuels to critical minerals. And we're just looking at the, uh, the share of the top three producing countries on to in terms of total production. What you see is that for the critical minerals, the top three producing countries tend to be really, really dominated by one particular country. Whereas for oil and natural gas, you know, the top three uh, comprise less than half of the total supply. And then there's a lot of other countries involved. And, you know, nobody's really dominating um, fossil fuels to the extent that the critical mineral market is. So, for example, cobalt, Democratic Republic of Congo really, really dominates that market. Platinum, um, South Africa, uh, over 70% of the market, global market of platinum. Uh, lithium, Australia and Chile. Graphite, rare, other rare earths, China. So, you know, this is, uh, it's a bit of a geopolitical problem, um, obviously. And um, one issue is that, again, getting critical minerals out of the ground, it's, it's also an extractive process. It's dangerous. Um, it's often socially unsustainable. So the uh, New York Times had a nice series last fall. This is fall of uh, November of 2021 looking at um, the cobalt mining industry in, in the DRC. And, you know, it's probably not terribly um, 
not terribly surprising, but you know, we're just repeating our kind of common colonial era um, issues where you know large multinational companies are coming in and making money at the expense of cheap labor and unsafe working conditions for the people on the ground who are actually uh, trying to mine this stuff and just make a living. And um, you know, this is a, a picture of somebody going into their homemade cobalt mine. Um, these are somewhat euphemistically called artisanal miners. Um, but, you know, in the DRC, you're looking at 72% of the nation in extreme poverty, um, even though copper and cobalt uh, have a, you know, export value of over $12 billion a year. Um, and so we've got, you know, 35,000 children working in these mines. So this is, this is a big problem that, you know, we, we need to overcome. Interestingly enough, I was just reading the other day, this, you know, I'm recording this in April of 20, uh, 2022. Uh, first quarter, uh, Tesla reported that half of its, uh, let's see if I get this figure right. Hold on, I need to go over here to my, uh, yeah, half of uh, all Teslas manufactured in quarter one have these new batteries that actually don't contain any nickel or any cobalt. And this is partly um, in response to the uh, global uh, nickel market crunch that we're seeing as a result of the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, but also, you know, if you can get rid of that cobalt, you're really uh, going to, I think, change things for the better. So hopefully we'll see more of this moving forward. Maybe I'll talk about that some more in our unit on batteries. Okay, uh, lithium is another uh, big problem. It's, um, you know, this is a picture of a lithium mining facility in Chile. And what they do is there's lithium just naturally occurring in the groundwater there. And so they just pump the water out into these leaching ponds and just let it evaporate. And they get lift with uh, lithium salt at the end, which can then be purified. But it takes about half a million gallons of water to produce a ton of lithium, okay? So you think about areas that are already water stressed, like Northern Chile, right? That's a desert. Um, this, uh, you know, is this really a good use of our water just to let it evaporate away so we can get some lithium out of it? Um, here's another New York Times article about a proposed lithium mine um, in, uh, I believe this is in Nevada. Um, and this is a, um, a rancher who's concerned about the uh, effect it's going to have on the water supply for his cattle. You know, they say they think the water table on his ranch could drop by 12 feet. Um, there's going to be, you know, toxic waste produced, you know, sulfuric acid, potentially uranium. So, you know, this, uh, this also has some areas where we could improve, you know, our mining practices, uh, obviously, but also our need for these uh, critical minerals. So even for low carbon energy, we have our own social and environmental sustainability issues. So just to wrap up, I'm going to go back to this quote from Carrie King's book, um, you know, assuming a goal of more people in a larger economy, then, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We can just keep doing what we've been doing. Um, and, you know, I would say that if we continue on this path now, we're going to have more problems we need to confront in the future. And so if we can come up with a more sustainable way of generating and delivering energy to the global population while still meeting the growing demand for energy, you know, we don't want to shortchange anymore. We want to make sure everybody has the energy they need. Then there's some challenges ahead that we need to address. And I hope that over the course of the rest of my lectures here, you get some ideas about what the, I think those changes need to be and what the engineering community can do for that. So next time, we'll have more of a positive note here. We'll talk about what sustainable energy is and some of the challenges in achieving it and what I think uh, the... Um, the opportunities are uh, for improvement. So thanks for listening and I'll see you uh, in the next video.